This story in the Gospel of Matthew is a story that we all know, right? Right? You've all heard it before. You live in a community where people farm. So it's a story that we understand, right? We understand about a soil and how sometimes seed doesn't grow in certain kinds of soil, right? You can plant something at one house and go down a couple blocks and it's not going to grow the same, right? Because we all know that that's what this is about. This story is really about soil. Soil, soil, right? I mean, after all, our first hymn this morning was, Yes, Lord, let my heart be good soil. Because we have a way to make the soil able to grow whatever God plants in it, right? Ah, maybe not. Is that really what this story is about? Is it about the soil? Is it about us preparing our lives and us doing the work to make ourselves ready for what God is going to give to us? See, here's the interesting thing. Last week we had Matthew chapter 11. This week we have Matthew chapter 13. Something's missing. We skipped a whole chapter in Matthew. Now, here's the problem with that. You see, what did our story this morning begin with? Later that same day. So unless you know what happened in chapter 12, you have absolutely no idea what is happening right now in this parable that Jesus is telling you. Because you have to understand what happened that day in order to understand what is happening right now. Right? Because Matthew says later that same day, he's connecting what just happened in chapter 12 to what Jesus just is about ready to tell us. So in chapter 12, we have to give, I'm going to give you a Reader's Digest version of chapter 12 here. You can read it later tonight if you want to, but here's the Reader's Digest version. Jesus faces severe oppression, right? His oppression intensifies in chapter 12. In chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, the Pharisees now debate Jesus directly. They're no longer talking behind his back. They're no longer debating with themselves. They're now debating directly with Jesus about the things that he's doing. The Pharisees actually start the plot for Jesus' death in Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. In verse 24, the Pharisees say that Jesus is in league with Beelzebub, or Satan. In verse 30, Jesus indicates that the Pharisees are now against him, right? Jesus sees what's happening and he says, look, these guys are against me. They're going to come and things, bad things are going to happen. The Pharisees are not bearing good fruit because they are bad trees. They're even referred to as a brood of vipers in verse 34. They're an evil, adulterous generation who ask for signs, Jesus says. So in order for us to understand what Jesus is about to say for us, we have to know all of that. Right? The Pharisees are plotting against him. They are now debating him openly in public. They're coming against him. And Jesus is talking with them and saying that they need a sign. They're not, they're not doing what they need to be doing. Right? So is this text really about soil? That's a trick question, actually. The answer is yes. <laughs> or no. Yes, it is. And no, it isn't. See, there's four different kinds of soil. And all of us are actually all four different kinds of soil. Because if you read down a little bit later, in the end of that reading we read, Jesus gives an explanation about the seed falling. So yes, it is about soil. But it's not really all about soil. You see, the way that in the Bible you can tell what a story is about is how does the story begin? Did Jesus, when he started his parable, say, Listen, there were four different kinds of soil and someone came and threw seed on all four of them. No. Jesus said, listen, there was a sower who went out to sow. What's the story about? A little louder. The sower. The story is not about the soil. The story is about the sower. Jesus' explanation later tells what happens when the, after the sower goes out. It is one explanation of the story, but does that mean it's the only explanation for the story? No. You see, this story is about a sower who went out to sow, and he was extravagant in his waste of seed, right? How many farmers do you know would go out and just over all of the land on their property just start casting seed out? I see the farmers over here going, are you crazy? <laughs> Just throw it out, right? You just have a big bag and you're just throwing it out all over everything. You wouldn't do that. 
It's a waste of seed. Right? In this parable, a lot of seed gets wasted. It talks about how he first cast them out, it falls on the path, the bird eat it. And then others grows up in rocky ground and the sun comes and burns it away because it doesn't have deep enough roots. And then some about growing up in thorns and the thorns choke it out. Right? None of these seeds produced the fruit of which the seed was meant to produce. And in none of these cases was it actually the seed's fault for the lack of growth. The potential is always there in that seed to grow. And the outside forces of the world sometimes come in and take away from what those seeds were meant to do. Right? No farmer today would go out and do what Jesus did as a sower here in this text today. Right? It's ineffective. It's not efficient or effective way of using the resources which you've spent a lot of money on. A lot of farmers take loans out from the banks based on their whole farm to buy crops, to buy seeds, hoping that that's going to produce enough to be able to pay the loan back and then make enough to even keep their family fed throughout the year. There's huge risk involved in that. And none of them would waste seed the way that it's wasted today. I even read as I was preparing for this and learned about different types of planters and different types of farm machinery now that will actually take into account if you have a central pivot irrigation system where that system hits in the field and it'll stop planting when it gets to a point that the irrigation system will not irrigate. It's a super system to make sure that no seed is wasted, right? We're not planting anything that's going to get burned up because we want to make sure everything gets the nutrients that it can to, in order to grow. No seed is wasted. But what Jesus says this morning in this parable challenges that understanding and that thinking and the way that we plant seeds. It also challenges our understanding of being faithful in everything that we do in our ministries, in our stewardship, in our evangelism, in our service, in our worship. Should we distribute the forgiveness of sins through Christ's body and blood, through the bread and wine that we're going to take here this morning, to anybody that comes forward? Are we all worthy to take this? And I'll be the first to say that there's some mornings that I'm not worthy to take this. Should we still do that? Might we be wasting some of God's grace on unrepentant sinners and the forgiveness of sins? And don't think I'm saying this to you. I'm saying this to me. How many of us are unrepentant sinners? How many of us keep... Don't, please don't raise your hands. <laughs> How many of us keep doing things over and over again, even though we know that it's wrong because we've justified it in our minds? Should we be mailing newsletters to people who probably don't read them and just throw them in the trash? Please, if you're not going to read it, at least recycle it so it doesn't go into a landfill. Or should we be distributing flyers? We're just getting ready to, to send out a bunch of flyers here to people in the neighborhood about our block party coming up. How many of them are actually going to come? How much time, resources are we wasting doing this? And as I write this, I think to myself, none of this is absolutely a waste. And as I say it to you this morning, I hope that you're hearing that none of this is absolutely a waste. None of it is a waste. Because that's what Jesus does. He throws that seed, He throws that grace, He gives His Word to everybody, regardless of where you're at, regardless of what's happening in your life, because each and every one of us is all four kinds of those soil at some point. Each and every one of us. And at times we're probably more than one. Right? Jesus takes an extravagant risk of throwing out His grace into the world, hoping that some of it is actually going to stick and that some of us are actually going to listen and that some of us are going to be prepared to hear that and to take it into our lives and to use it as something that is a part of us and to make our lives better. This parable challenges us to take risks. Risks that are going to fail. Risks that are going to be ineffective. I have some books on my shelves that talks about um, business models of stuff. One of them is sacred, sacred Cows Make Holy Burgers, I think is what it's called. It's actually a very interesting book. But it talks about the fact that if you want to succeed in something, you have to fail a lot more times to get that one success. The reason people are successful in their lives is because they're willing to take risks and they're willing to fail. And failure is not something that we need to look at as a bad thing. It just helps us know we didn't do something right and to move on and do it differently the next time. Right? Could this reckless 
throwing out of seed of God's grace by Jesus give an example to us to live by. That we are to throw out God's grace and love recklessly into the world. Because it's come to us as something that we own and have as our possession. But you know what? God's grace and love is not yours to own. It was given to you by God. And therefore you need to share it. Right? Let my cup overflow so that you can continue to refill it. But if we hold on to what we have, He can't possibly give us more. Right? And as Isaiah said this morning, he talked about... See, this parable goes against what Isaiah said. Did you hear Isaiah this morning? I almost did children's sermon on it, but then I heard the Romans as I was sitting over here, so I switched midstream. But Isaiah talked about how my word never goes out from me and doesn't come back producing what I sent it out to produce. Right? Isaiah said, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Now, if Jesus is sowing the word of God in our parable this morning in Matthew, some of it didn't do what it intended to do, did it? Again, this is one of those, yes, it did, but no, it didn't. You see, in our minds, it didn't do what it was supposed to do. It was wasted because the seed didn't produce what the seed was meant to produce. But in God's mind, maybe it did do what it was supposed to do. You see, because that seed actually did something. Each and every one of those seeds did something this morning. Regardless of whether they served the purpose that they were supposed to. They did something, right? The first seed fell onto the rocky path and the birds came and ate it, right? So the birds ate the seed. Now, is that a purpose for seed? Yeah? How many of you have a bird feeder in your backyard? What do you put in it? You put bird seed in it. It's seed. The birds eat it. And some plants, like wild asparagus, need to be ingested by a bird and carried someplace else and then fertilized and naturally moved by the bird and planted someplace else. That's what makes that grow. Right? Then some of the, the seed fell on rocky ground. It fell on the rocky ground and it came up and it got choked away by the sun. But what did it do in the process? It probably moved some of those rocks. Right? Those plants being there probably jolted those rocks a little bit so the rocks were moved around. And the third seed fell into the thorns. Okay, we probably don't want to think about the thorns needing something, but these seeds actually then did help feed these thorns. So each and every one of those seeds, the one that fell on the good soil, produced the fruit that the seed was meant to produce, but the other three still did something. And maybe they did what God intended for them to do. We don't see that because it's not what we wanted it to be. But all of these seeds had a purpose. They, uh, all of them experienced some type of benefit, even if it wasn't something that we saw nor expected. So then my question to you as we end this is, who is the sower? Now in Matthew's version, he connects Jesus to being the sower, and we can understand that, right? Because Matthew says, that he connects this to chapter 12, like I said, where he begins that same day. And by the use of the two verbs here, which you probably didn't catch, because I didn't catch it at first either. By the use of the same verb for to go out in verse 1, that same day Jesus went out of the house. And then the first thing when Jesus says, listen, a sower went out. It's the exact same verb. It's the exact same verb the exact same word. And the readers of Matthew would have picked that up. That's the connection that makes Jesus the sower in the Gospel of Matthew. So, of course, Jesus is the sower, but as there are two meanings to this parable, could there be more than one sower as well? Thank you. Yes, of course, right? The explanation seems to fit as well or better in the context that the early church, when the believers sowed the word, which sometimes was completely rejected, accepted for a short time, or believed and bore fruit, right? When the first disciples went out, they spread the word of God. And some people said, you're crazy. And some people believed it for a little bit and then said, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. And some people followed Jesus, right? 
Jesus instructed his disciples when he sent them out, he said, you received without payment, give without payment. You received as a gift, give as a gift. Everything that you have was given to you, therefore you need to abundantly give it back. You need to extravagantly risk everything that you have and throw it out into the world because that's what I've given to you. And you are the sower. Jesus is the sower, the early disciples were the sower, and now you are the sower of God's grace to go out into the world and extravagantly spread God's seed of grace, the Word of God, as God has given it to you knowing that some of it is not going to do what you hope that it will do, but that God will have purpose in everything that you throw out there. Trusting in our Creator, knowing that He's given to us to give to others, because He will have everything happen, as Isaiah said, in His time and in His way. He's wanting us to be faithful and to go out into the world and spread His grace and love to everyone. So go and extravagantly give what has first been given to you. Amen.